Welcome to White Space, a weekly show where we look at the news of the data center industry. Uh, this week is special because our editor Peter is on holiday and we have no idea what we're doing. It's all scary, so bear with us. Everything's falling apart. Yes, 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 but I mean, Peter is away, but the news doesn't stop. So, first of all, headline news, what has happened over the weekend that is sort of important? Yeah, half of the press is global switch, probably going to be sold, or at least half of it's going to be sold to an Asian consortium. Uh, Sunday Times reports that it's a Chinese firm, Daily Tech, which is a bunch of different subsidiaries, including a state-owned aviation industry corporation of China. And that's got a few people in the UK government a little concerned because, you know, China is very voracious with its appetite and some people are like, should they own internet infrastructure that is UK's? Um, yes, it is. And the price as well, I mean... Uh, Nine billion uh, pounds or 6.7 billion dollars is the rumour for half, and that's not bad. Okay, well, the one to watch, it's still early days, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, talking about things uh, that we're watching, uh, there hasn't been an official announcement yet, but Data Foundry, the, the, the data center provider based in Texas, uh, all of their data centers in Texas, so they're like, I think they have four facilities at the moment. They also have presence in Virginia through a deal with Equinix, and these guys are building another data center. I mean, what else would they do? Um, <laughs> it's a 40 million facility. It's uh, right next to their headquarters where they built Texas 1. So presumably this one is going to be built uh, called Texas 2. But how do we know about this is the interesting thing. So um, um, some people from a property website called BuildZoom have gotten in touch with us. And they were like, you know, like uh, there's this planning permission. I mean, there's like 16 million for a... For a uh, for the data center shell and uh, was a 30 35 million for a, for an interior build build out, and um, yeah 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 sure we checked it out. It looks like uh, data foundry is really building another data center, and uh, it made me think about planning permissions because technically you know like as 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 soon as any any documents have been lodged with the council, we should theoretically be able to know about this. So, and we've reached out to Data Foundry for cl clarification, maybe they want to issue a statement, so we're, we're waiting to hear from these guys. But, the, you, you know, like, it's not a secret when people are building a data center. So, so, so it, it, it's interesting how, how much time it takes for this information to trickle down to us. Okay, and now we're getting into sort of like the meaty specialist subjects. So, what has happened in the world of quantum computing? Yeah, well, so we don't usually report on rumors, but it comes from new scientists who are in a pretty reputable publication. They talked to a bunch of people in the quantum computing field. We know that Google was up to something. We didn't know exactly what they were up. They did, they did a paper saying that they wanted to achieve quantum supremacy, which, you know, that sounds lovely. Um, and we knew they were working on a 9 qubit machine. Now it turns out the rumor is they're working on a 50 qubit machine, and they're going to do a test, if, it, if they manage to build this by the end of next year, that it's a very specific test. Quantum computers are better at certain things than there are other things, but it will be able to do a calculation that would require twice as much memory as the world's most powerful supercomputer. Uh -huh. With a 50 qubit little machine that they're just, you know, working away on. Well, the, the fascinating thing is that Google actually bought a D-Wave computer back in 2013. They bought a more recent version as well. And they have over a thousand qubits, but they're not seen as proper qubits. They're kind of dirty qubits almost. They don't fully... Um, work that as a as a quantum computer, whereas this would be closer to a full actual quantum computer. So even though there's only fifty, essentially the the researchers said they're better qubits. And so now you've got this this American company is working on this big new advancement over here in the UK, where we're working closely with American companies. There's Privacy Shield came in for this data, but is it working? It is not working based on the stats. Okay, this comes from the International Association of Privacy Professionals and research sponsored by Ernst & Young, which is all right, fair enough. They, they, they know their stuff, right? They work with big companies. And according to their data, uh, there is much less demand for Privacy Shield than there was for Safe Harbor. So Safe Harbor Agreement, you know, sort of like we, we got it in year 2000 to basically make... Uh, uh, data transfers between EU and the US legal, even though, uh, you know, our, our attitudes toward privacy are everything but the same. Mm. Uh, and it, it, it worked until last year. Last year it was thrown out after a court case brought by Max Schrems, an uh, Austrian privacy activist, and um, the European Court of Justice decided that, you know, actually due to American sort of like NSA spying, mm. we can't deny that, you know, like there's extra legal overreach and it's not okay with Europe. <laughs> 
<laughs> so while the case was going through the courts, the European Union and the Federal Trade Commission already started working on a replacement. Replacement, the EU US Privacy Shield, you know, it sounds glorious, but turns out uh, there's just 34% of people using Privacy Shield at the moment. About 50% of people who needed these data transfers were using Safe Harbor, so the number, number has come down mm -hmm. considerably. So if they're not using Privacy Shield, I mean, they are transferring data, how does, how does that work? Okay, so other than Privacy Shield, it's just got a lot of spotlight, but there's actually two other ways to do this legally. One of them is uh, standard contractu contractual clauses. Now, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, I don't understand how exactly they mean, but I think it means like um, if your privacy policy, your contracts have certain points that essentially duplicate mm. the, the meaning of the, of, 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 of the safe harbor principles or now privacy shield principles, it's a mess. Um, if, you do, if, if you can provide the same level of, of, of protection, then that's fine. There's also something called binding corporate rules. Now, these things are used at the moment just by 8%. They're complex, they're expensive, but they're very, very good for large companies. So if you're running, you know, like if you're Coca-Cola, you're probably going for that. Uh, there's a problem though. Uh, standard contractual clauses, now used in 80% of cases because people don't quite trust the privacy shield. There's also a case in the European Court of Justice and uh, those things might be invalidated. Great. And, and if they are, then you know, like we're left without a good actual legal method to get data around. So to make another one. Yay. Uh, so certainly the one to watch, but essentially the warning here is um, we need to solve this quite quickly because people are losing confidence. They're not sure if they're in compliance or not. And uh, obviously the message from Ernst & Young is hire a professional to do this. Okay, and meanwhile, in the wonderful world of Facebook, open compute, and hardware and software standards, we've got what? Well, yeah, we all love Facebook for doing an open compute project, but if you're a small company, you, you don't have that ability to... Essentially, with Apple, you can have the device and the software. It's all beautifully working together. You can't have that with open source. That's always the kind of bit of other side of it. You might have a test on all these different formats. Facebook's aware of this problem, so they said come to our lab, we open up our lab, we're going to have a bunch of hardware, we'll work with you, you, you have a product, a software that you want to try out on it, just come down, try it out, we'll, we'll see if it works, we'll beta test it here. And yeah, it, it's a smart idea, it helps with the open movement, uh, and also helps they choose the hardware, so it's the hardware that they want on their open compute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they started with quite big names. I know Canonical mm. has been there, a couple of other people. It would be interesting to see what the smaller guys can yeah. do with this. I mean, yeah, they've, they've, been, they've only officially announced and announced. They worked with Canonical and Red Hat previously. The idea is now they're opening up more. There's an email. You can just email that you want to try it out. Obviously, you need to be near Facebook in the US. You can't just try it out here. But if it's successful, maybe they can push it out. Maybe they can even release sort of a standard so that other companies, other big companies, why it's not Google and Amazon and all these other companies trying it. So essentially inviting people into their data centers and saying, this is the, the stuff we're using. Mm. Does That's your right. software work with it? Yeah. yeah, can't see any problem with that. It seems smart. Yeah, yeah. And um, continuing talking about standards, there's a tiny little bit of plastic now being developed by a German company and a Japanese company, which could make a lot of difference in the data centers of the future. Uh, we are talking about the Ethernet jack. You got so excited about this, it's hilarious. <laughs> so, Harting, they're a family owned German company which previously sort of like um, helped develop various implementations of the RJ45 with the Ethernet jack, you know, like the, 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 the rugged sort of like field deployable configurations and whatnot. Um, then there's a the uh, Japanese company Hirose, which has been developing connectors as well, but this time for smaller things, for things like smartphones, you know, they've participated uh, in the creation of um, USB mini and USB micro, so very, very familiar with standards. So those two companies came together to develop a miniature version of the Ethernet jack for 10 gigabit internet in particular, but the idea is, yes, this is going to be cheap, dirty connectivity, you know, tiny. like, yes, yes, if you're still running copper and, 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 and you, you need those tiny connectors, but I guess the real aim here is Internet of Things, mm. because Internet of Things, small things, yeah. will need to be linked together, they will need small connections, the smaller the better, and this is what these guys are doing, they have 
experience with standards and they're hoping that they're also going to make this little tiny thing a standard but there's no information on how it looks like there's no information on when it's going to come out there is an agreement between the two so they haven't signed up any big uh, customers or anything no 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 and apparently it's coming next year so when it when it comes we're going to take a look at it and there'll be a white space on that for sure yes but that's, I think that's, that's everything we wanted to say this week. Uh, join us next week uh, when Peter is back. And uh, yeah, stay safe. Bye-bye.